All right. Okay, so let's go to uh, Old Testament book of Genesis. It's easy to find because it's the first book. Uh, Genesis chapter 32. So as the little sign up here says, uh, prevailing with God, uh, it might be a passage that's familiar to a lot of you, might be totally unfamiliar to some of you, and that's fine. That's fine. Every time we open it, we try to look like we're looking at, at it for the first time. <laughs> that's helpful. But uh, Genesis 32, and I'm, I'm at uh, 22 through 32, verses 22 to 32. So we're going to talk about this a little bit, prevailing with God, what it means. Maybe I just ask, ask the question, uh, do you ever have, this is a dumb question, because everybody's going to say yes, but do you ever have a sense of unrest? <laughs> like when, when was your latest sense of unrest? But, you know, we have this, right? A sense of troubling, you're troubled. And either you can't quite put your finger on it as to what it is, or you can put your figure on it, but you just don't know what to do, you know, this type of thing. And so we're kind of uh, feeling out Jacob here. That's just going to be the guy that we're going to be talking about, trying to feel him out a little bit in terms of this. Now, for those of you that are longtime students of Scripture, you know, you say, well, I know. You go to that passage because it teaches about prevailing with God in prayer, right? Isn't that the whole idea? He wrestled with the angel, and he didn't let go, just like you wrestle with God in prayer, you don't let go, and that kind of thing. So, all right, there, let's get that message out of the way, and then we'll go to this one. But we, we have that kind of a thought. Not saying there's anything wrong with that. I mean, definitely prevail in prayer. Definitely, definitely. Don't let go. You know, do that. But I'm, let's just say that um, that might be a an application, right? A decent application. So let's just try to... To, to really see what this is about struggling, you know, struggling. I don't mean struggling financially or struggling like that, but I mean a struggle, you know, like a wrestling match, like this wrestling. Let's look at this, Jacob wrestling, and uh, with whom he's wrestling, how, how we're to understand that. And we do have a little bit of help because there's a whole other passage in Hosea. Anybody want to try to find that one? Uh, in Hosea, that way you what the table of contents are for, but you got Hosea chapter 11, uh, verse 12 through chapter 12 through verse 14. Here again, this particular account of Jacob's wrestling with this man, undisclosed, but then it's really disclosed in Hosea as being God, that he's wrestling with God in this sense. Hence, what does Jacob say here? He calls the place after the, after the wrestling match, he calls the pla place Peniel, Peniel, or sometimes it's Penuel, depending on your translation, but Peniel would be the Hebrew, which means the face of God. You know, I, I saw the face of God. And, you know. But uh, these two passages set what happens in a different light. So we're looking at Genesis, we will, 32, 22 to 32, and see just what's going on there. And then we're going to sort of go back a number of chapters and set it within its context. We can see just what's going on. Because again, just to say, we want to deal with Jacob. Jacob's our case study. You know, we want to say, hey, what does Jacob have to teach us about struggling with something, wrestling something, trying to understand that God, you know, God's the one who's the source of this trouble. And I mean that in a good way. It's a good kind of trouble when God is doing the troubling. It's a good kind of struggle when God is the one with whom you're, you're struggling because, you know, he has, he has a, uh, a good purpose for that. And what we find in Jacob is that he's trying to strengthen something good in Jacob. But then if you go over to Hosea, and we don't have time to do this whole thing, but if you went over to Hosea and studied it in his context, you find this is a negative thing now among the people of God. You know, the wheels have fallen off morally. They're not following the one true living God and all this. And, and so God is struggling with them, but now it's sort of to rid some, uh, something bad, something corrosive, something corrupted, uh, something that's corrupted them, and he's trying to rid them of that. So we have really have, and, and, and uh, Hosea cites this historical account in Genesis, again, he says, just like when God wrestled the angel and all this stuff happened, he says, see, and God's saying the same God is doing the same thing here, but for, but for different reasons. And I'm sure there were, there were some things in Jacob's life, as we'll find, 
that Jacob needed to um, be delivered from, <laughs> other things he needed to be strengthened. I just think it is an incredibly interesting thing. And what I say about, you know, prevailing prayer, I don't mean to, what, diminish that. Of course, that's a great application of this. But I'm saying if you dig a little deeper, you know, go a little deeper, go a little wider, um, you can see some contours um, about Jacob's life that I think it helps me, and I'm sure it helps you, when you see um, who Jacob really is, uh, you know, the, the things that are going on in his life, uh, and uh, it's very identifiable, as you find with most of the men and women uh, in Scripture, very identifiable for today. Maybe, um, you know, centuries and centuries distance, so distance in time, distance in language, dis distance in culture, all this stuff different, but listen, we're all human beings. And it doesn't matter what age you live, we all suffer from the same things. It's the same God with them, same God with us. So let's just take a hit on, uh, and this might be just what you call Discipleship 101, you know, and that's where we are. We never graduate from that, I think. I think we're always there. Discipleship 101. 32, uh, 22, at the night, uh, Jacob got up and he took his two wives and two female servants and his 11 sons and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. Now, in my mind, I know where that is, but you may not. But that's what they had those neat maps in the back of your Bible for. But just imagine the Dead Sea, if you can find that. And then, you know, Galilee, uh, the Sea of Galilee to the north of that. And then this Jordan River that goes like this. Just back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, all the way down. About halfway up, or maybe a third of the way up, you have the Arnon and the Jabbok. These are just two little kind of tributaries that go off. And uh, it was a, you know, sort of a little uh, prominent. But he's but just trying to, to, to put this in a location. This is a guy, and this stuff happened at this particular place. Um, and, and it says, uh, he got up and took his two wives. Now, you have to ask a question, like, why is he doing this, and where are they going, and why are they going there, and all that, but all that in good time. And after he sent them across the stream, he sends them ahead. He sent over all his possessions. Oh, he had possessions, so we'd have to go back, wouldn't we, to find out where did he get those from? How did he come by those? Um, and so Jacob was left alone. This is where God, I mean, you could be in a crowd, um, really, you can have this very complicated, sophisticated life, schedule, responsibility, duties. You could just be overwhelmed by all that stuff and somehow you're alone, right? You just sense this deep sense of isolation. And this is where God goes to work on you. You know, God will have your attention. He will have my attention. And regardless of how much um, is going on, there, there's God. So Jacob is left alone and a man, here it says a man, wrestled with him till daybreak. You'd have to go to Hosea to get a little background to find out this is in fact um, God. Be an inter some interesting explanations here, but I'm not going to bite on that. Um, when the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was, was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. You could just picture the struggle going on. Then the man said, let me go. For it is daybreak. That's a command. He's telling them. It's done. It's finished. Everything that I'm going to do with you, my reason for coming here, this is done. It's finished. It's over. It wasn't like, you know, let me go. You're hurting me. <laughs> you know, Let me go. I can't take any more of this, please. Uh, but Jacob said, I'll not let you go unless you bless me. And they answered, what, well, what is your name? <laughs> There's a reason why you ask him, what is your name? Because his name means something, right? Supplanter, and we'll look at this in a moment. You cheat, you know, if that's what your name is. You better be reminded of what your name is because there's a blessing coming and it's going to it's gonna have something to do with your name that's going to change. But then the man said, well, your name will be no longer Jacob. And this whole purpose for coming was for this singular change. What good's a change in a name if the character doesn't go with it? Right? We can call ourselves anything, right? And so there was something fundamentally transformative that was happening here that by means of wrestling with this man would finally bring him to the point of, um, 
you know, being this one who would then be characterized as having struggled with God, you know, which is, by the way, all of us. That's all of us. We're all, we're all like Israel, you know, take that for what it's worth. But it's saying we're all those that struggle with God. That's who we are. We struggle with God. And I don't mean that in the sense that I'm not going to do what you want me to do, God. I mean, that may be sometimes what you say. But, but, in, but in essence, that's the nature of our life. Either God interposes himself in our life because of something we've allowed to metastasize or something we've, we've allowed to take root in us, and God is going to then um, bring something to bear in order to rid us of that. That's the Hosea passage, isn't it? But here, um, it seems like God, maybe there's some element of that here, but also in a sense of God's got a purpose for Jacob, and but for this struggling, how is this going to play out? And so what's the lesson to Jacob? You're kind of a cheat. You're kind of a deceiver. Um, you're a trickster. You're a supplanter. And so something's going to happen because whatever will become of the people of God, the covenant people of God, is going to happen not because of you. It's not because of your planning and plotting and doing and all that stuff because that's how Jacob is living, right? That's how he's surviving. All of this is by his own wit. This is a man who believes in God. This is a man who, I'm just talking about Jacob now, before all this. He believes in God. He trusts in God. And we'll see evidence of that where he looks to God. God has intervened already in his life. And so he's had all of that happen. And yet, but for this final sort of um, transformative event, um, you know, Jacob would walk away limping, wouldn't he? And you look at verse 31, he says, the sun rose above him as he passed Peniel, again, meaning the face of God. This is what he named it. Interesting. God changes his name. Jacob changes the name of the place. <laughs> That's interesting. So, and he was limping, limping. I don't know. Did he limp the rest of his life? Did he just limp? Who knows, right? But he's limping. He's limping, right? And they cha and the Jews changed their whole diet dietary thing because of this, which is kind of interesting. They memorialize it in their diet. You know, it's just interesting. But here he's limping away, right? He's never been stronger. He's never been stronger with this limp. And here, but for his acumen that he brings into every situation, his ability to think his way through, to plot, to try to, I mean, just to live like that. And all that culminates here. And we see what God, what God does. Yeah. I mean, God does that. He does that stuff in our life. You know, and it's, it's transformative. We think we've been weakened. We think we've been diminished. And here God has come in. And if we've learned anything, we've learned that we don't matter. Just he matters and what he is doing. And just let him do what he's going to do because he, he does a great thing. Let him give you a limp, you know. Hey, if that, if that makes me better suited. Because look at what's going to happen now, right? So God made a promise to Abraham. He gave him a covenant. Then that went to Isaac. And then it went to, oops, it didn't go to Esau, did it? I wonder what happened there. How in the world does the covenant go to Jacob and not, well, you know, but now it's Jacob. And then we're going to learn about Joseph after that in this book. And so no one will ever be able to say that any of that was corrupted by some, some, some young man's cunning. All right, so uh, Jacob is a supplanter, so if you're, if you're keeping score, you can go back to 25, and uh, right, so here twins are born, and you have the older one, Esau, coming out, and uh, right behind him, right behind him, there's Jacob, and what's Jacob doing? He's grabbing his brother's heel, right? So that's what Jacob means, a heel grabber, and, all, and that's literal there. He's literally a heel grabber. But yeah, can you imagine the kid coming out and saying, well, let's name him Jacob, heel grabber. But wow, if that wasn't a self-fulfilling prophecy. I mean, really? Really? You know, I mean, so, and this is Jacob. Jacob's living, living up to the name, you know, grabbing at his heel. That, that becomes idiomatic. You know, it's an idiom for uh, somebody who's a deceiver. You don't want to be known as a heel grabber, you know. Mm -hmm. 
but that's his name. You know, he wears it like a tattoo. It's his name. Um, so let's just see how this plays out Ch later on in the chapter because we're going to have a lot of details here. It's 2534. He took advantage of Esau's contempt for his birthright. And this is what we find out. Esau, the older brother, really didn't care. You know, he just, just didn't. You know, so what didn't he care about? Well, there's his father, basically the birthright, you know, and you could go into a lot of discussion on that, but I'm not going to bite on that one either. Um, here's the idea that um, his father's wealth, his father's possessions, all of this stuff falls to him. He's the older and all that stuff, right? So let's just say he just had contempt about that. It's just a little bit of the backstory about this is who Jacob is. This is who Esau is. And now already Jacob is going to take advantage of that. Um, also, uh, you know, you see a little bit more about Esau. For example, in chapter 28, after this whole thing happens, and uh, uh, not only is the birthright lost to Jacob here, but also the blessing wherein you would achieve um, the standing. Uh, in, you would be the one after whom the covenant would then pass to you and through your lineage that's gone later on. Esau gets so mad, he wants to kill his brother. We know that. But you see the other thing that he did? He gets so mad at his father, right, that his father would fall prey to his brother's stuff, even though his father really can't see at that point. You should have known that type of He gets so mad at him. He says, yeah, you don't want us marrying any of them Canaanite women? Well, I'm going to go get me some of them then, you know, right? And this is Esau. Now, all it just tells us is the mindset of Esau a little bit. We get the mindset of Esau through his actions. We get the mindset of Jacob through his actions. And then chapter 27, 36 to 40, in, in and through there, you see Jacob now with the help of his dear mother, you know, <laughs> plotting, plotting now. Guess who she favored? <laughs> That's right. Plotting this whole thing out. Stole the eldest son. That's Esau's blessing. Um from Isaac, and that's probably the whole covenant thing, you know? I mean, what good would it be to have all the wealth and possessions, but not the covenant thing, not, not to be heir of the covenant? I mean, this is Jacob, you know, he, he wants the whole thing. And yeah, he's very calculating, isn't he? Maybe you know people that are calculating like that. Um, you just, you want to keep your eyes on Jacob all the time at this point. So now it's chapter 27, uh, verse 41 and on. I'm just grabbing some verses here. Um, this is a hanging issue now, if we could call it that, for Jacob. Like this isn't going to go away. You know how sometimes we think the answer to our problem is put enough time and distance between them, and yet it just doesn't go away. You know? This is something that as God is going to show us, Jacob is going to have to deal with it at some point, along with other things. But this was an issue. And uh, Esau just basically says, I, I'm just going to kill him. You know? I'm going to kill him. <laughs> um, isn't it like Jacob didn't know this either? This thing became known to Jacob. You know what I mean, really? 27, uh, chapter 27, 42 to 45, uh, somewhere, somewhere in there, right? Um, Esau held a grudge against Jacob because of the blessing of his father. The days of mourning for my father are near. Then I'll kill my brother. And 42, so mom says, Woo, hey, this is what's going to happen. Your brother's really, really mad. Time for you to put some ground between you two guys. You've got, you got to clear out. So she makes up this whole story, uh, you know, basically about how she's being disadvantaged or something. And, and he, he needs to go and, and find a wife from you know, the same way Isaac did and in that, in that sense. So all I want to see here is this first occasion where Jacob is on the run, right? And so after this, he's, he's on the run. Ever been on the run? You, know, you could be on the run and not go anywhere. You could be on the run sitting in a chair, but you could be on the run. Um, and so what happens? God abandons Jacob? God, no, no. And this is what's really interesting, right? At, the, at, the, at this particular juncture, um, you see, like in chapter 28, uh, God encounters Jacob. He's en route to Haran. Uh, Haran is a town in Padan Haran. Does that make sense? Or Padan Aram, the Arameans, the Syrians. The, but this is this district 
Um, you have like the nation of Israel down here. You have like Babylon and all that stuff, Tigris, Euphra or Euphrates and Tigris. And then you have up here this fertile crescent up in here. That's the trees going. If you remember when Abraham came out of, <laughs> it's my imaginary map. When Abraham came out of Ur, Ur, which is down there, just everybody, you know, think Babylon, Iraq, you know, when he came out of there and he starts coming this way, where did he, right here, Haran. And so these are like, um, uh, this is the, the, the mother's family, you know, Rebecca, and she is, um, her brother is Laban, and this is where Isaac goes back to get, but anyway, let's just say they got family there. So go on up there, go on up there. And that's where he's going, so he's heading He's going to head there because there's family there. I'm, I'm going to go there. I can, I can hide out there. You know, I'm, I'm going to get away because my brother wants to kill me. And so he's got to cool off. You know. And so here's the thinking. Enough time and distance and whatever. This thing's just going to go away. And as soon as he cools off, then I'll come back. And this is the scenario, right? Still him. You know, how he can think his way out of this. He was the cause of it, but, you know, this is how he's going to somehow think his way out of it. Uh, but God encounters him, you know. This is what we see in chapter 28, 10 through, through 22. He has this dream, and in the dream, God reestablishes, reaffirms, renews the covenant. You know, the big picture. Here's the big picture thing now, all the way back to Genesis chapter 12, the covenant with Abraham. Um, you know, I'll give you a land, I'll give you a, a, a prodigious family uh, to, to populate that land. I will, I will bless you in that land, and through you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. That's the whole thing in Genesis 12, 1 through 3. Then you come here. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out. I'm sure that at that particular time, now think of it. Have you ever have you ever sort of read of a promise of God or maybe felt as though God was giving you this incredible promise and then you look around and you you take stock of your life and you you begin to inventory everything and you say I don't I don't see it God you know I mean all I see is these these catastrophic issues and problems and all this stuff so look this is what God is telling him and this is in a dream and he sees the angels ascending and descending and all this stuff and again, the name change, we're going to call this place Bethel, Bet, you know, you looked that up in Strong's, Bet, the house of El God, the house of God, it's Bethel, house of God, because he says, wow, I've encountered God here, and, and here's, here's God stepping into this, not saying, oh, Jacob, what did you do, you deceiver, you know, and so there's something of a promise here, and hope that's being given to him. Um, and then you see Jacob kind of, um, in return, uh, making a covenant with God. If you look down at the end of chapter 28, verses 20 and following, Jacob says, if you'll be with me, if you'll watch over me on this journey that I am taking and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear. I'm going to tell you something. 20 years is going to go by, and that boy is not going to have to worry about clothes on his back and food in his stomach because he's going to be one of the wealthiest guys in the territory. I mean, it, it, it blows my mind. So here he is. He has nothing, right? Absolutely nothing except everything rides on this covenant. Either God is who he says he is and God is true to what he says and I can count on his word or I can't. Now, Jacob is still a bit unconvinced about this. I mean, he's so unconvinced that he has to make a covenant with God. You ever think about that? Like, if he was just convinced, there'd be no doubt Right? He'd be no doubt. He'd just keep going and say, okay. But now he says, if, if God will be with me. I said, Jacob, you still, wow, you still question? I mean, God just appeared to you, man. He just, <laughs> he just like blew your mind, you know? But, I mean, can you imagine that? Like you're having this conversation with God. I can't imagine this. Like I'm just trying to think, first of all, you'd have to, Get the defibrillators out because I'd be, I'd be like flatline. That'd be it, you know. I'd be toast. I'd be like, and I'm going to say like, okay. So I hear what you're saying, God, but you know, I mean, if you're going to be with me, I mean, if, if, but who do you think you are, Jacob? You know, seriously. But then who do I think I am? Don't I do the same thing every day? 
in my ignorance, you know, and in my stupidity, don't I do the same thing? Uh, I mean, what does it take to trouble your world? What does it take to stir the pot? Different things for different people. What does it take, right? And then all of a sudden it starts to, to, to stir and we say, well, well, if, if, if God, you know, you, you'll get me through this. Oh, if you'll help me, if you'll, if, if, if. I say, what did I just tell you? Like how many times? And then, and then you ever have one of those sort of uh, experiences where God just intervenes and you know it's God and he just wowed you on one of those and, and, and you say, God, for the rest of my life, I will never forget this moment, ever. I will never forget this. I will never doubt you again, God. You know, never like that. I mean, unless I'm the only one. But I know, I, I know. How many times have I done that? And I just, I just, you know, I, I don't say this. It's just a Doug thing. I say, it's a human thing. I just pinch myself and say, yep, it's still me. And I'm still human. I'm still an idiot. You know, and I'm still growing. It's just okay to say that stuff. Because it's true. You know. Speak the truth. Um, 20 years. He's got nothing, you know. God does his best work that way. With nothing. And, uh, yeah, so Jacob sojourns, which means to travel, to live among people that are not yours, really. 20 years in Padan Aram, his uncle Laban, he, der he derides. So what does he get during this whole thing? We're talking, you know, wives. You only get one, though. <laughs> don't, don't just, you know, don't read too much into this with the plurality. But we're not talking about that today. Uh, <laughs> wives, flocks, wealth. And listen, he attributes all of this blessing to God. Now, there's something in there that's how I think, gosh, there's hope for Jacob, right? So look at, look at chapter 30, right? He's doing this thing with, um, with Laban, you know, and, but chapter 30, verse 29, what does it say? Uh, Jacob said to him, this is Laban, his uncle, from whom he, he had Rachel and Leah, you know, his wives, children, all this stuff. But he says, you know how I have worked for you and how your livestock have fared under my care. The little you had before I came has increased greatly and the Lord has blessed you wherever I have been. Now that's a little hard to kind of grasp. I'm not sure how much of that is Jacob's pride or how much of that he is gloating on God. I don't know. There's a lot of eyes in there. Um, but here he's throwing this all in. Go. Chapter 31, 9 through 13, for example, is another little block of uh, stuff. So God has taken away your father's livestock, speaking to his wives, and have given them to me. He's referencing God here. The angel of God said to me in the dream, Jacob, and I answered, here I am. And he said, look up and see all the male goats. So, so anyway, you know, this was his... His uh, breeding practices by which he was to, to build, some of it was based on what the other sort of pagan nations did, some of the superstitions that they had. But then God is telling him, God is, is telling him exactly what's going to happen in this, and, and Jacob is attributing this stuff to God. Um, there's a falling out with Laban, doesn't he? There's a whole falling out, and uh, Jacob then just say, on the run, part two, right? So the first time... First time on the run, got to put, it's about 400 miles, even though they measure kilometers there, but let's say 400 miles, getting up to put on the run. Now he wants to be on the run back, basically. Um, and this is in keeping a little bit with what God is telling him. Um, you know, God is telling him, you know, go back. And uh, for example, in 31 and 3, he says, now when all this falling out with Laban's sons and everything starts getting convoluted and troublesome, go back to the land of your fathers and to your relatives and I will be with you. So he's on the run again. Um, he's having increasing disfavor with Laban. Um, his flight then from Padan Haram now was in obedience to God's command, as we see. Um, trying to put enough distance between himself and Laban, just like he did. Got to get out before Esau finds out. Got to get out before Laban finds out, that kind of thing. 
So his, his flight there is not entirely honorable. His wives retaliate against their father. They're upset because the father's cutting them off from this inheritance. So they say, fine, we're going to steal our father's household gods. Whatever that's all about. That's another interesting little place to go, but I'm not going to bite on that one either, except to say that they knew that that stuff was important to Laban. Mm -hmm. So when you, when you want to get somebody, you do what? You grab what's most important to them. So that's what they're doing. Later on, though, later on, though, we're not going to get to this part, but later on in the story, a couple chapters after this, Jacob is telling his servants, everybody, get those, get those gods, get those gods, gods out of here. You know, so there was that, just that tendency, um, you know, to accumulate, to live uh, under the terms of those that are outside of the people of God, the way the nations live uh, among them. But nonetheless, his wives retaliate against the father. Jacob uh, attempts to depart with the flock's family and wealth in secret. Attempts to do that. But like Esau, he's got to face Laban in the end. And in doing so, another deception um, you know, occurs. He devises a plan for his own survival. And so after they steal these, these gods... Um, then, then, uh, Jacob with his wives are saying, listen, you know, um, you know, first he says, you know, if, if anyone here is found to have taken those, they'll be put to death. You know, I'm sure, you know, with his, um, Rachel saying, uh, you know, so, okay, you know, hide them, hide them. Won't go into the details there, but it's just another attempt to, to deceive. So he's got to face Laban in the end, and he does so. He also has to face his brother Esau. Um, and so what does he do there? What does he do there? Just before we get to the passage we read earlier, chapter 32, I mean, what's going on? This is Jacob still being Jacob. i got to figure this out, you know. Um, I know, because if I'm going back, uh, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to somehow have to deal with my brother Esau again. So send some people on ahead. Um, you know, let's just give them forewarning, let them know I'm coming because he left alone, but he's coming back with my word. You imagine that entourage, all the flocks, all that. I mean, he's just coming. It's like an army coming. Uh, give him some gifts. And then later on, he says, I was hoping that would pacify him. You know, just, just do that. Um, he is dividing his, all his stuff into a couple groups just in case, hey, I'm cut, cutting my losses in case I lose one, I won't lose at all. He's just envisioning this, this big uh, battle with um, Esau. And this goes to um, his emotional state where it says, that night, 32-22, that night. And what a night, right? Because now everything is coming to a head. All the stuff from 20 years ago and all the stuff most recent, it's all coming to a head that night. I mean, that's, that's really a, a, something that's said with great import there. Um, so what happens again now? Just like when he left, God intervenes. You know, chapter 32 and verse 1, Jacob also went on his way. The angels of God, tell us a lot here. The angels of God met him. Didn't say he had a dream. Did it just the angels of God met him? It's like back at Bethel. You know, he saw the angels ascending and descending, but now this wasn't a dream. This was just the angels of God met him. And when Jacob saw them, he said, This is the camp of God. And so he named the place Mahanaim. Now in Hebrew, it's an interesting language. We have a singular and we have a plural, like in English, but we also have a dual. The dual. That's what this is, Mahanaim. You translate it. Two camps. It's kind of weird. This is the camp of God, and he's, then he names the place two camps. Because he's recognizing that, in fact, he's not alone in this process. So somehow God reveals to him in, in some way that, Jacob, this isn't just you, and this isn't just your camp and my, but he's got a camp. And listen, you imagine somebody in life, right? You start out with nothing. I remember doing a, a marriage conference one time, and this was with a, a fair amount of couples. There were newlyweds there. There were people that were married 30 years. I said, let's take the 30-year 30, 30 ones. Strip it all away. Strip the houses and the mortgages and the kids and everything. Strip it all away. And all you have 
It's just you too, because I can remember. I remember with Sally, you know, just standing there. My father's doing this, but just standing there, looking her in the eye. That was my whole life right there. That was it. That was everything. And I said, can you imagine that yet again? Is it enough? Is she enough? Look her in. Is she enough? Because you know what happens. You get all the baggage, all the baggage in life, all the stuff, all the pursuit of this and dual careers and the whole, you know, who knows what? You know, everybody's got a different story. And I think of that with Jacob, right? So look at all the baggage. He starts nothing. It's just Jacob. It's just Jacob and God. Is that enough? Or are you just going to rely on your own wit or on your own wisdom? You're going to rely on all your, all your stuff. This is God sort of reintroducing himself into the equation and saying, listen, it's not just your camp, my friend, because you've got quite a camp there. And you've got it all devised out how that you can cut your losses and maybe still hang on to half of it because you know your brother's coming. You know he wants you. You know he wants blood. You know he wants a war. And you're still thinking about how you can preserve just just some of it. And God shows up and says, listen, there's another camp here. There's another camp here. And don't you forget it. And boy, we need to hear that. We're not alone in this thing. Um, and the other thing we find here, not just to remind Jacob, but the last thing that we'll quit is to conquer Jacob. Because if anything, we need to be conquered. And you see this happening in 22, 22 to 32. Um, Jacob, you know, is endowed now with a covenant. He has it. This book has fallen upon him. He's the man of the covenant, the progeny of Israel. The whole future of God's redemptive plan with humanity flows through Jacob forward. This isn't going to be a thing that's going to happen according to Jacob's wit and wisdom. But Jacob has to become convinced that this is this is God. Um, so, uh, you know, I'll tell you what an interesting parallel is for that. We don't have time for it. But interesting parallel if you were to go to Luke 15 and do the prodigal son. There's incredible parallels between these two things. You know, an ill-advised journey, a sojourn to a distant land, the intervention of a loving God, and the beginning of a new life. I mean, it's amazing if you just took those four little things and superimposed them on Jacob and then on that, on that prodigal. The prodigal, if you remember, where it says, after he'd gone off as far as he could go, spent all that he had, was at the lowest point of his life, and then he came to his senses. And when he came to his senses. And I see this uh, of Jacob and this name change. Jacob is awakening to a new reality going forward. You see, that's us. You know, we're, we're the Israels. We're the ones that are struggling with God. And either God, God has interposed himself, you know, here is this struggling. As much as we want to say it's a person that's causing this or an event or a situation or something, God has brought this trouble. God has brought this unrest either because he's trying to strengthen something good that needs strengthening or he's trying to rid us of something that is corrosive and something that is really holding us back from becoming all that we can be in the kingdom that we might walk away from it with a limp or what Paul might call his scallops you know his his thorn in the flesh we might walk away from it like that but we're going to have a greater appreciation of who God is and how God can use us okay Let's pray. Lord, thank you. Thank you for your blessings. Thank you for preserving this, this uh, story of Jacob because we could, we could just read it a thousand times and add more and more um, beautiful principles and contours and lessons for our life. So thank you that you are God who doesn't quit on us, doesn't give up on us. Uh, you're that camp that comes in alongside of ours. You're that God that never leaves us, never forsakes us. Uh, you're always with us, um, and Lord, for for we who who um, struggle, for we who uh, are are maybe even troubled today around these tables, help us take a fresh look at that. Say, what is it, God? What is it, God, that you're trying to tell me? What is it that you are are doing? Because you you always intend your best. 
for us. And we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.